All right. It's good to be with you this morning. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to 1 Samuel chapter 12. 1 Samuel. It's over in the first part, <clears throat> Old Testament. 1 Samuel. While we're turning over there, a pastor speaking about being cheerful, being joyful. Kind of remind me of a little uh, something funny I had read all a couple weeks ago. Oh, here I see all these dismissed to Sunday school. <clears throat> and I'm one of the group that gets upset when the pastor forgets that. And here I am right in the same shoes, forgetting. Dismissed for Sunday school. We have four or five classes back there. Pre-primary for the little ones. Primary for the middle ones. And junior and teens. So then we have junior church, but I think this morning we'll have junior church stand here and listen to some good singing uh, by uh, the group Witness. Good to have them with us this morning. But uh, back on that funny uh, joke I had read, I guess I'll classify it as a joke. I'm not much on jokes, especially if I'm the one that has to tell it. But about being joyful and cheerful, it's very important. It's just a mindset. God says we should be cheerful and joyful. We'll look at some of that actually this morning in our lesson. But it uh, reminds me of an old couple that had been married for a long time, up in their 90s, and they had died. Both of them had died and went to heaven. You know how heaven jokes go. They are met there at the gate by St. Peter. I don't know where they got that, but uh, he meets them there and has one of the main angels take them in and shows them their mansions that they have, that be Sharon and they get up there, and that angel begins to show them their, their mansion, and they're just awestruck with how it's built the size of it, they take them inside, they show them the rooms, their bedrooms, the bathrooms, they show them the kitchen and all the food all laid out and all the, uh, the, the servants there that they have to watch over them for the rest of their life uh, up in heaven. Everlasting life, the Bible says, and uh, shows them the pool, the grounds, and they just are awestruck. And then that old man turns over to his wife and said, honey, if it hadn't been for your brand muffins for 10 years every morning you made me eat, I would have got to enjoy this a whole lot sooner. <laughs> and so it doesn't matter where you're at. It just depends on what, uh, what kind of mindset you're in. So I'm thankful to be saved this morning. First Samuel. Now we have been on a mini-series. I call it a mini-series. Uh, we have been looking at vessels and being a vessel fit for the master's use or an honorable vessel and our springboard for that was 2 Timothy chapter 2, where it says that there were different vessels in a great house, and there's vessels of gold and of silver and of wood and of earth. And, he, and the Bible it makes a statement there in 2 Timothy 2 that if a man purge himself of these, and so we begin to look at making ourselves available, available Christians to the purging that God takes us through so we're a fit vessel for the use of the master. And so we, we'll move on from that. We kind of concluded that last week, but I'm going to springboard off of that, that lesson into this one. Uh, the vessel of Christ, looking at the servant, if you please. So I'm going to, before I read 1 Samuel, 1 Samuel chapter 12, and I believe uh, I, I have in my notes verse 24, but I want to I start in verse 20 because it gives me a little more context and we'll grab a little bit more meat there where we're going to springboard this morning. But we're going to look at the attributes or the qualities of a servant of God. Now, if you're saved this morning, you are in the classification as a servant of God. You're a servant of God. Now, it's up to you, self-imposing, on whether uh, what you do for God or not do for God. And we'll look at a verse there in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and God uh, will... He, he, he's, a, he's a God of accounts. He's a God of order, a God of record. And so he writes things down, different things down in our lives. And so we'll, we'll get to look at this. But a servant of the Lord, it's your, it's your will on uh, whether you really want God to serve, uh, you to serve God through yourself, through your life in ministry, or you don't. And there will be a number of, of reasons. If you're in the ministry at all as a preacher or a pastor, you, you'll run across some amazing excuses that people have and then some lame excuses that people put out why they're not able to serve God. Let me say this. The Bible makes it clear that everybody that's been saved by the power of God has the ability to serve God. It doesn't matter whether you're a half of a one, a one, or a ten. 
It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter your age. It doesn't matter your educational background. You are able to serve God. God gives every man, it says, a gift upon salvation to be used uh, in the church, to be used in the church or of the church. Now, having said that, let me say this. The concept of being a vessel, and we, we were kind of springboarding off of our lessons on vessels, fit for the master's use is an indispensable part of the Christian walk. Uh, some people say, well, I didn't realize I actually was a vessel and to be used that way into ministry. Everyone is, if you're saved. If you're lost, I understand. But if you're saved, you're to be used uh, part of the Christian walk. Even if we lack other desirable personal qualities, and some of us do, uh, we must have the attitude of a servant to please Christ. It takes a servant's heart uh, to please Christ. Christ was all about teaching his disciples when he was on the earth and walked with them uh, how to be a servant and to have a servant's heart. Notice with me in 1 Samuel chapter 12, 1 Samuel chapter 12, and I'll start in verse 20. It says, And Samuel said unto the people, Fear not, ye have done all this wickedness, Yet turn not aside from following the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. And turn ye not aside, for then should ye go after vain things, which cannot profit nor deliver, for they are vain. For the Lord will not forsake his people for his great name's sake. Because it hath pleased the Lord to make you this people, moreover, as for me, God forbid that I should sin against the Lord in ceasing to pray for you, but I will teach you the good and the right way. Notice with me in verse 24, only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider how great things he hath done for you. And so we see here that the Samuel is the prophet speaking. He's the spokesman of God for the nation of Israel at this time. And he's trying to set them, set them right here. And so he tells them, look, I, my job as, as the prophet, the spokesman, is to teach them wrong from right and which way to go. It's kind of my job and pastor's job and teachers this morning to teach uh, the right way, not the wrong way. Teach you that you should not go this way, but you should follow after God and the things of God. So that's what's going on this morning. As servants of the Lord, we're to be wise and attentive to what is being taught or preached. It is uh, something that you will and I will be judged on in the judgment seat of Christ's judgment. Not the great white throne. Well, maybe in the great white throne, but the judgment seat of Christ for the believers. And I'm slowly headed that way to that verse in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. But let me make this point for, first. We're going to look at two, uh, two points of a sermon. We're going to look at the inward qualities of a servant of the Lord. I believe it's important to examine and look and know for sure, without any doubt or hesitation, what the inward part of a servant of the Lord should look like. I believe, number one, on the inward side of us, you and I this morning, we should have a wholehearted service attitude. A wholehearted service, not a haphazard, hazard, I should say, haphazard service or a lackluster type attitude. We should have a wholehearted service. And uh, our key verse emphasizes two important aspects regarding our service for the Lord. Notice, notice with me there in verse 24, it says, uh, 1 Samuel 12, verse 24, only fear the Lord and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider how great things uh, he hath done for you. So we see, serve him in truth, in sincerity, not just in show. And so a lot of times we, as Christians, we kind of get wrapped up in the show because uh, it's maybe sending glory our way or we're getting praise for it. And we need to be careful with that. We need to serve Christ or God, if you please, in truth and in sincerity. Notice with me the point number two, serve him with all your heart. I believe this is a key uh, phrase for a servant to grasp anybody should grasp, is all of your heart, not part of your heart, but all of your heart. You notice, as we read in uh, verses 20 down through 24, notice that Samuel was bringing up some of the things that the nation of Israel was caught up in. They were trying to serve the Lord, but they were trying to also serve themselves. And he says, the things that you were serving yourself, I'm living here, was vain. And he says, those vain things can't give you anything. 
They're, wa- they're a waste of time, and it takes uh, preeminence from your God. And so he was trying to teach him there that, that you need to follow after God wholeheartedly with all your heart. This morning, I could uh, encourage you to serve God with all of your heart. It works better. It lasts longer. It uh, takes less, less effort if we give him all of our heart when we uh, enter the service. And I'll say again and repeat this, it's not just your mind thinking, I think he keeps saying this over and over again. If you are a Christian, you're to be in service. Not a service worship, but in service doing something for God. And we looked at that the last couple of weeks. I won't try to reiterate some of that uh, too much. So we might have to rehash. Take your Bibles and turn to Joshua. Joshua chapter 22, and we'll notice what Joshua has to say, say here to the left. Uh, Joshua Judges, so Joshua chapter 22. I do have quite a few verses this morning to look at, so we'll try to get through some of them and make our points. Joshua chapter 22 and verse 5. Uh, this, ver- uh, this chapter here is about Reuben and Gad, the two tribes there, but we're going to catch some things that was uh, penned here by the power of the Holy Spirit. Joshua chapter 22, verse 5. And we're on this thing about uh, what, how God kind of dealt with the nation of Israel. Remember that the Old Testament is a schoolmaster to us for today. So we are going to spiritually apply some of this, and then we'll end up in the New Testament looking at some wonderful verses. Joshua chapter 22 and verse 5. Notice with me, it says this uh, in the Bible, But take diligent heed to do the commandment in the law which Moses, the servant of the Lord, charged you, to love the Lord your God and to walk in all his ways and to keep his commandments and to cleave unto him and to serve him with all your heart and with all your soul. So there he's adding your heart and your soul. Notice with me, we'll look at verses in the New Testament later on. It says the same thing. I have an understanding that, that God has not changed his mind on us, you and I, for today, uh, giving him our whole heart and all our whole soul. We're to love him and we're to serve him with all our heart. That has not changed. Uh, I was uh, uh, told this by an old, older preacher. He says, look, if, if God changes his mind on something from the Old Testament to the New, he'll let you know. He'll let you know. I'm thinking of a verse there where he says the the law of ordinances had been blotted out. Those were the ordinance laws that the Old Testament, they would take a lamb or they'd take a sacrifice to the priest. He said that had been done away with. He's very clear on the things he wants done away with from the Old Testament. So here, I believe this follows all the way through. God loves his servants to give their whole heart to him, especially in service. So we see here from Israel, Israel would sin. They would steep and fall into idolatry. Then God's wrath and judgment would fall upon them. Then you have the captivity and suffering of the nation of Israel. They would go into captivity or they go through a great suffering because of their sin of idolatry. And then eventually followed by sorrow and repentance from the nation of Israel. They would uh, have sorrow and they would repent and get the thing right. I mean, simply change their mind, stop doing what they were doing, and go back to God. And finally, God's deliverance and restoration, he would, he would grant them. That's how God works. He doesn't care for the cycle that the nation of Israel did, but this went on and on and would begin all over again after they had uh, they had steeped back into sin and idolatry again, and it would repeat itself. And we're trying to learn something here, not to try to repeat this time and time again. But that would be the cycle that the nation of Israel would take if you read the Old Testament, especially those verses and books containing to the nation of Israel. Uh, let me, let's look at another verse here. David charges his son Solomon, and he gives him some words of wisdom. And again, they're inspired for us, for you and I today. Take your Bibles, turn to 1 Chronicles, back towards the right, chapter 28. We're looking at the inward attributes of a servant of God. Chapter 28 is toward the end of 1 Chronicles. 1 Chronicles chapter 28 and verse 9. Notice with me in verse 9. 
It says, in thou, this is uh, King David speaking to his uh, young son there, Solomon. Uh, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind, for the Lord searcheth all hearts and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. If thou seek him, he will be found. Of, of thee, but if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. And so that was uh, that was uh, that was that would be a sobering conversation with a father, with him telling uh, young Solomon the, these things. And so he says here, serve him with a perfect heart. The perfect heart here refers to an undivided, unwavering, committed heart. This is kind of what we're on. Our first point on looking on the inward parts of a servant of the Lord is a wholeheartedness. We will serve God with a wholehearted service. A wholehearted servant of God is to be loyal. Paul instructed Timothy... Now we'll go to the, first te- uh, the New Testament here. We'll look at 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6, I believe is what I want. You've got the Thessalonians, right over Thessalonians, you have Timothy. 1 Timothy, we're after 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse, uh, I believe verse 1 is what I want. Here's what uh, the Apostle Paul is, is writing to Timothy, a young pastor here. He said, let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. Now, if you've been with us, some of you have been with us for the last couple of weeks looking at this, you notice that the word, this word blaspheme has followed this this lesson, these lessons. And so it's careful that we not blaspheme against the word of God. We made a statement that anyone that makes the statement that they can do without the church of God or the, the, God, the church that God has instituted, ordained and commissioned and provisioned, that the man or that person is speaking blasphemous words against the Bible. And so here, the Apostle Paul is talking about servants. And we're looking at servants this morning. And he says, look, these servants uh, that are under the yoke are to count their masters wor- worthy of all honor. And he says, and the reason why is that the word of God or God's name be not blasphemed. And so this was very important not to do this. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, we're going to swing to Matthew real quick before we get on to our next point. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 24. This is another statement that, uh, that God says to, to us. Verse 24, Matthew chapter 6, he says, No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Ye cannot serve God and mammon. And so that is a doctrinal statement from the Word of God that lays things out for us today. You and I, Christians... Servants of God, if you please, are not able to serve God and mammon. Mammon's basically a picture or type of the world and self. Anywhere you find yourself showing up, self, uh, self motives, self ambitions, self philosophies, and there's a lot of it today. Uh, you're, you're, that is mammon. That is going to be self. God doesn't promote self. He promotes God. And so he's saying something here about a servant of God. He is to have this wholeheartedness to serve God. You say, will it work any other way? According to these scriptures, and no, not very well. You're going to have a problem in the flesh, and you'll have uh, some other problems with these points I'm getting ready to make. Number one, we see that a servant of God inward should have a wholeheartedness to serve God. Number two, he should, have, he should be loving Inward, you should be have a love uh, for God and for the things of God. I believe we're missing this big time today in our churches. A love for the things of God and for the service in the ministry of God. We, we show up on Sunday morning, Sunday school, uh, regular service, maybe Sunday night if we're doing pretty good, and maybe if we're doing really good Wednesday night, but that's about it. We don't want to do nothing. No, we don't want to be involved with any other ministries in the church. Let me state ministry. Ministry is an outreach of the church to see that souls, lost souls, come to see Christ. It not, might not be a fellowship, might not be a meal, although it could be if you're witnessing. 
See what I'm saying? It's specific. It's specific. It's to reach others for the gospel's sake, as what Paul says. And so we'll define that a little bit better. But number one, I believe a servant, according to Scripture, should have a loving heart. Servants have a variety of motives for continuing in their position. We'll go over some. Some are paid for it. Some servants today, you're paid for it. Uh, in my job where we work, and those that have jobs in here, most just about everybody in here does, or is retired, probably still has a couple jobs just to make ends meet. But if you have a job, you are paid. You are paid for your service. I'm paid for my service most times. And so um, they, some people are paid for it. So, of course, you're loving towards that person that owes you money, you want to make sure you please them because that's part of maybe your agreement to make sure that person is pleased with your service so they'll pay you. So some people are paid for it. That's why they're loving. Some uh, enjoy the appreciation. I know some people who just work, maybe not for money, but they like the praise that they'll get because of the job that they did. There's nothing wrong with that, but if it's a self-motive motivating you to get self-praise, now we're back into that thing that we're trying to downplay is self and God's nowhere involved. And we're speaking of servants today, servants of God, so that self-appreciation won't go far in God's eyes. It doesn't. It doesn't, it doesn't take much. Matter of fact, God takes notes of it. And then at the judgment seat, he's going to bring it back up. Some hope the service will uh, be returned to them somewhere down the road. So there's a, there's, a, there's a string attached. People will do things for other people or do things at work, and there's always a string attached. You say, have you ever done that? Most definitely. Uh, we was down there working on the ark, and there's some things that we needed to move that we did not have the equipment to move. So what do you do? Well, I go to the donut shop. I know men. I know how I am. You get donuts, coffee, food, whatever. And you, you can get a lot out of people. You, uh, it's, you say, man, you, yeah, oh, yeah. Yeah, and I learned it from Dad. So when he comes back, you can talk to him about it. And so uh, you feed them the donuts and the coffee and say, hey, I need to use your law, your lift, for a couple of minutes. Can you do that? And uh, then you begin to work your deal. Well, some people do that in the ministry. In God's ministry, they'll work deals because they think they're going to get something in return. This is not how you work the ministry. And a lot of people do that today. Hence, why you have the statement when people look at church, I don't need nothing to do with those hypocrites at church. You say, why? That person could have been the object of that motive at some point in ministry and been abused or used the wrong way. So we need to be careful on what our heart motive is when we're being the servant of the Lord. By the way, you're not just a servant of the Lord when you show up to church. You got the whole rest of the week, days, hours, and minutes to be the servant of the Lord. So when you show here, we all look good. We're dressed up, got a suit and tie, yep, got a haircut, and we, we, we think we have it. But it really starts outside the walls because it's serving, it's servicing others first and then the world. So it's important on how that goes forth, okay? Here we go. So we look at leveling, uh, lovingly, being loving, humble, who. I don't have much on this because it hit home. Uh, in a day when self-esteem is deemed essential for success, and it is today, by the way, humility is a quality in short supply. Humility is, in, is a quality in short supply. Hebrews chapter 12. I'm going to show you a verse on this. Hebrews chapter 12. And I'm watching the time. Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 28, I believe is the one I want, says, Wherefore we receiving a kingdom which cannot be moved, let us have grace whereby we may serve God acceptably, acceptably with reverence and godly fear. This is speaking of a service that is rendered from a servant uh, towards God. That's why uh, we get on things. Like, for instance, we have a group here this morning. Yes, they're singing for us, but they're really singing for God. Uh, music was designed for God. Okay, maybe us enjoy it, lifts our heart. We, we teach here that it tunes the heart to prepare it ready for preaching or the message of God. And so uh, music, you, sometimes you get in the music world, and what we've seen, and have been just touched enough a little of it, that people do it for self-glory. And that glory is the wrong, it's going to the wrong place. That glory, if any glory from music, should go to God. That's some of the difference between a world's music and God's music. So, uh, yeah, you can take a God music and have self all over, and it's wrong. It's a wrong motive, is what I'm saying. And we want to make sure that we have the right motive, the right motive. 
So humbleness. Humbleness is very important, uh, and it's missing today. A, a third one is joyful. The Bible has much to say about the joy that a believer can and should have in Christ. Now, quickly go through these. I won't turn, but I'll give you the reference. Luke chapter 2, 10 through 11, it speaks of the birth of Christ. And the angel declared that to the, uh, the, the servants or the, the, the shepherds that were in the field. And he says, Behold, I bring you great tidings of, gr- of great joy. And so there's joy there, the, the joy for the birth of the Christ. You have joy for the Word of God found in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 6. It speaks of the, the joy of the Word of God. Listen, if you, if you this morning, you and I don't have any joy towards or for the Word of God, we have a major component missing on the inward attributes of you and I as servants of the Lord. We're missing it. And you should have a joy for the Word of God. Uh, so you should have a strong joy. Also, thirdly, joy in God's presence. It's important to know that there's joy in God's presence. You'll find that in Psalms chapter 16 and verse 11. Why should a servant of the Lord serve joyfully? Psalms 100 and verse 5 says, The Lord is good, that's why. The Lord is mercy and everlasting. His mercy is everlasting. That's another reason why we can be joyful about. Uh, And His truth endureth to all generations. I, th- I believe there's three points there that why we can be joyful is because His mercy is everlasting. His word is to all generation, not just to a select group at the turn of the century, but it's to us today and every generation on past if the Lord tarries. And then God is simply good. That is why we should have uh, and be filled of joy. We uh, have looked at a servant of the Lord, uh, what, is, what is he supposed to be on the inward now we're going to look at what a servant is supposed to do. You see, oh man, it gets, it gets a little closer to home. It definitely does. This is the fun part. If we have what we are supposed to be, if we, if we are what we're supposed to be, that inward part, we will do what we are supposed to do. Simple kind of, kind of logic. We're to be doing what we're supposed to do. If, we're, if we are what we are, what we say we are from the inside, we have a whole heart, we're humble, we're joyful, we have this, then all of a sudden, then why aren't we producing and working in ministry? Well, we're missing it somewhere. Uh, I got 10 minutes. That's enough. I think we can do it. <laughs> Outward qualities of a servant of the Lord. Out, and I've seen pastor, he's already left. Oh, man. All right. Obedience in his actions. Wow. A servant is to execute the commands and wishes of his master. He must obey his master or he is no servant at all. Remember our context. We're servants of God, the Most High. And so we've looked at the inward attributes, now the outward attributes. Obedient in his actions. Let me ask you this morning, are you obedient in your actions for God? If I was going to answer that, I would say no, if you were asking me. Luke chapter 17, verses 7 through 10 speaks of this. A servant is to obey his master and not count it a remarkable thing. If you, if you read Luke chapter 17, verses 7 through 10, you'll see that it's not, to be, uh, it's not to be accounted as some great thing. When we, I have children, I have five children now, and that's kind of hard for me to believe, but five beautiful children and a beautiful wife. But our children, one of the things we teach in our home, and in homes might differ from different from home to home I'm not saying but one of the things is if we have a chore for one of the children to do and they do it we don't oh that's great Woo! we give you five dollars this is great no it's it's an acceptable reasonable we told you to do it that's one of your one of your uh, chores so we don't write it down in a log and put it on faith I mean you can if you want but that's their chore that's what they're supposed to be doing it's not above and beyond the call of duty you might say so we want to make sure that it's not just a, uh, counted as a remarkable thing when we're to just do a reasonable service. First Peter chapter 2, verse 8, the servant is supposed to obey an unkind master as well as a kind master. Now we get into some touchy, like, man, oh, no, I just quit my job because I can't handle my boss. Well, if I did that, I, I would be broke. Really, I am broke, but I would be really broke. <laughs> There has been some crazy people that I have crazy, and I, crazy is not just a word I throw out there. It's for sure, man. Crazy people that have worked for that, you think, how do you work for somebody like that? That's demanding or turn, change of their mind every 10 minutes. 
And uh, you, how does that happen? You do that because the Bible says no matter who your master is, whether it's an evil taskmaster or a good taskmaster, you're to serve them with a whole heart, lovingly, humbly, joyfully. You go down through. So how can you do that? God's grace, man. It ain't nothing that we can muster up, but it's God's grace that we can do this. I'm talking about the outward attributes of a servant of the Lord is to be obedient in his actions. And so we've asked ourselves this morning, are you obedient in your actions towards God? Let me say this in Titus 2.9. In other words, the servant is to, to obediently please the master in all things without putting up any arguments. Uh, but, 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 what well, don't you think? All leading questions. Keep your mouth shut and hear it. Say this. I learned this from Pastor Todd in the five and a half years I've been here. I'm happy I'm here. I'm just happy that I'm here and glad to be here. And you go on, you shrug it off. Oh, there's some things with you can't, maybe some little things you, you won't be able to get over, but God will give you the grace to get through it. Let's end there because I want to finish this maybe next week. Uh, if Dad's still out, he should be. He's, I believe he's in Dayton this morning pre preaching. But we're talking about the outward now attributes of the servant Lord. Why I don't, I hesitate to stop is because you, nobody will be here next week. So I, no, 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 come back. We'll have a fun time with it. And it's to get you to thinking. That's why this is put together is to get you and I to thinking that we can do more for God. And what are we doing? I want, to, I want, I want you to question what are you doing? Begin to analyze what are you doing? What can you do? And then get busy doing it. Get busy doing it. You can do. There's more that can be done. There's more that needs to be done. And so I believe this will be challenging. That's what I want it to be, challenging. So the outward attributes of a servant of the Lord, obedient in his actions. The second one, you can write it down. You can wait for it for next week. Diligent in his duties. And we'll look at some verses on that. All right, let's all stand. And we'll pray and be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we bow before you. Thank you for those that have come out. Father, I pray that you would suit a blessing to the hearts. Father, some of this stuff uh, can be uh, uh, rough, direct. And Father, but I pray that it should be with love and with long suffering. And Father, some will get it, some won't get it. But Father, we pray that all hearts are attentive to your word and uh, that there'll be a blessing and an encouragement and a charge for us that are, uh, Father, needing to be in more service. Father, we thank you for the opportunity. Father, be with these men that are guests uh, today, the witness group. Father, be with them. Lead them. Fill them with your Holy Spirit. Be with our pastor and the message you've prepared and given him. Fill him with your Holy Spirit. Be with the congregational singing. Be with the offering and the choir. We ask all this in Jesus Christ's blessed name we pray. Amen. Thank you. You're dismissed.